All right. Good afternoon, maybe. Depends on where you're logging in from around the country or around the world. But I want to welcome you to today's Vet Girl YouTube live session. Super excited. We're going to be talking about updates to osteoarthritis management. We have Dr. Dykus with us. Dr. Dykus, thank you for being here. As always, we love our YouTube live session. So thank you for being here. But you all know, we love, as I'm going to go through some housekeeping in a second, we love knowing where you're logging in from, from around the country or around the world. So go ahead and type that in. I see all my screens buzzing going over here. So thank you. Thank you for being here with us. I'm going to start again. Oh, we have Colorado, Central New York, Alabama. They're they're coming in, Dr. Dykus. And as I said, we have a, a quite a nice, uh, a loyal group here, Iowa. Des Moines, welcome, welcome. But let's start a little housekeeping of what we're doing today. And I'll, I'll read off some more awesome locations coming up in a moment. Oh, I forgot. You don't, you want to know where we're logging in from. So my name is Garrett Pactinger. I'm the co-founder of Vecker. I'm going to look out my window. Yeah, rainy and cloudy Pennsylvania. Dr. Dykus, where are you logging in from? I'm coming in from uh, same type of weather as you in Maryland, um, just sort of outside the the Baltimore DC DC area. So it's kind of an overcast, rainy, but semi warm day. So no complaints, at least till tomorrow when it gets cold again. Awesome. And we have a Marie, we have Alabama, Virginia, Kansas, Nebraska, Montana, rainy Seattle, Davis, California, Arizona, and the list goes on. So please continue to type in Justine and I love to know where you're logging in from. First off, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to Elenco. They're one of our amazing educational partners. And with their support, we're able to provide this completely free complimentary race approved session to you all today. So again, thank you so much to Elenco for being here with us today and being an amazing educational partner. Now, as I said, this is live. This is interactive. You can ask questions, but how are you going to get your CE certificate? This is super, super duper, very important. You can either, and I will put it in the chat coming up, type into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash VG for vet girl. And then today's date, which is 228.24, or you can use your fancy smartphone and use that QR code feature. We're going to keep this open until 1 p.m. Eastern, so 30 minutes after the end of the session, so you don't have to miss anything. And again, I promise to mention this again and put that URL in the chat for you, but please do it before 1 p.m. And also importantly, please make sure when you enter your email address, you use the email address you use for your vet girl login. That's how we will provide and merge that CE certificate into your account. We know sometimes the YouTube can be on a smaller screen for you. If you hit that bottom right little open box, it'll become full screen for you. So you see us full in 4K HD, which I know you want to do. We hope you are interacting with Vecrol in a multitude of ways. This is just one of the platforms we use. We have webinars, videos, podcasts, rounds, and our amazing certificate programs and more. So make sure you check out the full offerings of Vet Girl. We love our multidisciplinary approach to CE. We hope you're loving it as well. If you're not a Vet Girl member, please sign up. You get a 14-day trial membership to access the entire site, get a sense of our style and our format. No credit card needed. Sign up, take a look. We hope you love it. Now, we don't want you to have FOMO. If you haven't signed up yet, Vet Girl U is going to be in New Orleans this year in June. I have one small little issue, though. Our vet tech program just sold out last night. So you can get on our wait list if you are a veterinary nurse, a veterinary technician. We still have a couple spots left for the veterinarian track, but please don't wait because our vet tech track technically sold out last night and our vet track is selling out soon. So don't miss it. We don't want you to have FOMO. With that said, I know you're not here to listen to me today. We have the amazing Dr. Dykus with us. Dr. Dykus, again, thank you so much for being here. If you can give the audience a little bit of a background of who you are, what you love to do, and then please take it away. The floor is yours. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, so I am an orthopedic surgeon. I'm in the, uh, the Baltimore area, originally from the Southeast. I grew up in North Georgia, did all my training in the Southeast. So for those of you representing Alabama, uh, Texas, I think there were some other, uh, 
uh, places in the Southeast. Um, obviously, my passion is in orthopedics. That's where uh, all of my expertise lies, in particular things like arthroscopy, minimally invasive uh, surgery, fracture repair, deformity correction. But then a lot of uh, what I talk about, what I do, what I see, and, and a lot of my research is actually in the area of osteoarthritis. It's been a passion of mine since I was a vet student and where pretty much my master's took me and, and all of my, my research is usually focused in, in this area. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. And I think with that being said, we can, uh, we can get started. Um, oh, and I, I did just see somebody coming in from Chile. Fantastic. I was just there for my first time ever. Beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, I had so much fun there. Uh, and then I think I also saw we have somebody on from Germany, which is interesting enough out of all the European countries somewhere I have not gotten a chance to, to visit yet. So I'm looking forward to that, hopefully at some point in the future. So before we get started, just a few disclosures to get out of the way of companies I lecture, consult, and get research funding from. So very much thankful to Elenco for sponsoring this um, YouTube live event uh, for us to be able to share some, some information um, for us to talk about a topic that hopefully many of you see very commonly, and that's going to be on osteoarthritis. And so, you know, let's take a second and pause and look at two radiographs where we've got this image in the upper left is a, is a patient with what I consider to be severe elbow OA versus in the bottom right, it's a patient with mild elbow OA. So I want you to think to your second yourself, you know, are you going to manage these patients the same way? I mean, you've got the same joint, different patient, but same disease condition. Are, are we going to approach these the same way? Or are we going to maybe change up things a little bit? And if we take a look, you know, perhaps at a uh, different um, scenario, we've got uh, a patient on the left that has stifle OA. And this, of course, is what keeps me in business as a surgeon. This dog has a torn cruciate ligament, but has moderate OA associated with that versus the image on the right is a patient with bilateral severe hip OA, secondary to hip dysplasia. So again, two different patients, same disease condition, but different joints. So are we going to approach these or manage these in the same way? So we're here for just a short period of time together. So I want us to get through first recognizing that osteoarthritis affects the entire joint. Um, I'm going to introduce a concept that I think is very important on the ebb and flow where we have these periods of calmness followed by periods of, of flare-ups. And I think that's important because that really establishes how we're going to approach our, our management strategies. And then lastly, once we've established how we're going to do it, we then need to talk about what the multimodal management of osteoarthritis actually is. And so if we look at it OA in general, so there's something that causes uh, damage to the joint. That creates this pain and, and this creates a big inflammatory response. And while OA may not be a primary inflammatory disease, it is a massively inflammatory condition. And so if an animal is painful, there's going to be a decrease in exercise. And that's important for several fronts. One being we need to maintain as much uh, range of motion as possible because range of motion is directly correlated to limb function. And so if they're inactive, they're going to start to lose range of motion, which means they are going to have an effect on ultimately limb function, but also nutrition within the joint is produced from synovial fluid, which comes from motion. And so the worst thing we can do to a joint is leave it immobile. And then if they are less active, we're going to see muscle atrophy occur. And if they're eating the same amount, but not utilizing as, as much in calorie burn, we're going to see weight gain. Then that's going to create undue stress on the tissues around and in the joint, uh, resulting in, in cartilage and subchondral bone damage, as well as damage to other structures, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is also going to continue the release of inflammatory mediators, which is going to continue driving the destruction within the joint. And then also, too, we're going to see changes at the brain level, where we start to see increased sensitivity of, of pain. And the problem is, is it's sort of a cycle that continues on and on and on. And so our goal should be to perhaps break up the cycle or put a permanent it stop to it would be the ultimate goal. And so we'll talk about some things at various time points where we can ultimately uh, get ourselves in line with managing these patients. But it is important to understand that osteoarthritis is the number one cause of chronic pain in dogs. And I would imagine many of us have heard of the um, saying that 20% of adult dogs have radiographic evidence of OA. And you might think to yourself, well, gosh, I take lots of radiographs of dogs and 
I see radiographic changes of OA a lot more frequently than probably just 20% of the dogs I see. And then they, we were also taught that radiographic signs don't correlate to clinical signs. And, and that's very true. I mean, think about the dog that comes in with, you know, vomiting. So you take abdominal radiographs to rule out a foreign body, but there's really bad hip OA, but the owners have never brought that up. And, and you don't perceive that that being an issue in the dog uh, currently. And so I would call that more incidental OA, or I would call that uh, radiographic OA. Um, the nice thing is that NC State just uh, published this study that they said, well, let's take a group of dogs. So it took about 123 dogs from the age of about eight months to four years. And so the, the dinger here is these were puppies to young adults. And they found just in that group that 40% of them had radiographic evidence of OA. So I think that statistic of saying 20% of adult dogs is old data. But more importantly, they took those 40% that had radiographic evidence of OA and they said, what percentage of these have clinical OA. And clinical OA is where we have both radiographic signs and joint pain. And they found that 60% of dogs with radiographic OA had clinical OA. So what this means is that while radiographic signs don't correlate to clinical signs, if we see OA radiographically, we really need to do our due diligence to make sure that they don't actually have clinical OA as well. And it's not surprising at all that this high of a percentage of young dogs, so puppies to young adults, had radiographic evidence of OA. And the reasoning for that is OA in the dog is not an old dog disease. It's an NEH dog disease. And that's because it's usually secondary in nature to something. Uh, and that's usually a developmental orthopedic disease. So Dogs don't generally develop arthritic changes just because they get old. And so when we think about the joint, I, I want us to think about the joint like an organ. You know, the best example would be the stomach, where there's all these different cell populations that they collectively work together for the stomach to do its job as an organ. Well, the joint is very much the same way. And while we beat up on the cartilage, there are other players involved with a lot of crosstalk amongst them. For example, we can see thickening to the joint capsule, which also has a very rich blood supply and innervation to it. And in patients with OA, they will have joint effusion, which can create some capsular distension and create uh, discomfort. And then I think the forgotten child tends to be the synovium. And the synovium is responsible not only for nutrient waste exchange, but it's also responsible for the production of hyaluronic acid, which is the main nutritional component to the articular cartilage. And so in patients with OA, there's a really raging synovitis going on, which means that the quality and quantity of nutritional aspects to the articular cartilage is less, but there's also impaired nutrient waste exchange. So all these inflammatory mediators stay within the joint. And then we do see changes to the articular cartilage, which actually has a very simple function. Its job is to dampen the compressive forces onto the subchondral bone. However, articular cartilage has no blood supply. So therefore, for what that means is nutrition comes from diffusion within the joint fluid, uh, but there's also no innervation. So when we talk about pain with OA, none of it's actually coming from the articular cartilage. And if the cartilage isn't functioning well, then the changes to the subchondral bone occur where that it becomes more thickened, it becomes more brittle, it becomes more dense. We see this as sclerosis on a radiograph, and it becomes painful to walk on. And what's not pictured here are all the periarticular fibrosis that develops that further inhibits range of motion in there for limb function. And so when we think about osteoarthritis, I like to use the ocean as an example where we know that it's always going to be changing. There's always going to be a high tide and a low tide, and that's very predictable. And I like to think that OA is similar. It's always changing, but it's very unpredictable. And so what I mean is that we can have these patients uh, in these periods of calmness or remission. So think about like a beautiful day on the beach. Life is good. We know that these patients have OA, but they're not clinically affected, so they have radiographic OA, or they have a condition that could develop OA, so a dog with a torn cruciate ligament, doesn't matter what I do surgically to stabilize the knee, they're going to develop OA. Or more importantly, we take a proactive approach to management. We utilize our canine osteoarthritis staging tool or our COAST tool, and we have a preclinical grade one dog. So in these patients, we're going to focus on the baseline, such as joint supplements, omega-3 fatty acids, disease-modifying OA agents, 
focusing on weight reduction, maintenance of strength and fitness, and the concept of daily exercise. However, on the other side of the fence, we can have these periods of exacerbations or flare-ups. And this is where life is not good. There's a storm brewing. We're going to have to retreat. These are patients that we know they've got OA and they're clinically affected. So they have clinical OA. Here, we've got a focus on getting the flare up under control. And this is where we really harp on analgesia and taking a multimodal approach. Because in an ideal world, we want the image on the left. We want to avoid the image on the right. But we have to understand that as the disease process of OA continues, we are going to have those flare ups. So storms are going to occur. There, there's no doubt about that. What we need to do as a profession is recognize that, that flare ups occur and then also counsel owners how to recognize a flare up so that we can get it under control, get the storm to pass as quickly as possible to get back to that nice day on the beach. And so when we look at what we have available to us, we've got our NSAIDs, our analgesics, we've got joint supplements, we can do physical rehabilitation both formally and informally. We can have daily exercise, but we need to make sure we differentiate that from daily playtime with owners. We can inject things into joints, we can inject things into muscles, we can inject things under the skin. Perhaps there's a missing link, something that we haven't recognized yet that could be beneficial. And then also, too, we've got our omega-3 fatty acids. And then how many of us have seen an overweight dog? So, you know, right now in the U.S., about 60% of adult dogs are considered overweight or obese. And so when we decide on what we're going to do as far as management goes, I think regardless, and, and regardless of where they're at in the course of the disease, we need to keep the aspect of managing inflammation, modulating, minimizing, or eliminating as the number one strategy for, for management for osteoarthritis. And so remember that keeping inflammation at bay is going to be key. And so if we have these patients that are more incidental OA, so radiographic OA, or they've got a dog with a torn cruciate ligament that can go on to develop OA, or a dog with a coast grade one preclinical OA, I'm going to recommend a joint supplement. We're going to have to pick a company that meets label claim, that ensures quality and purity, that has benchtop research and development, as well as in vitro data saying that if you take this ingredient, you apply it to this cell, it's going to have this effect. I also think we have good clinical evidence on omega-3 fatty acids. I shoot for about 150 to 175 milligrams per kilogram of EPA and DHA daily. Um, we can also add in ETA or green lip muscle. And then as far as our disease-modifying OA agents, I think adequin is very important. However, I don't give it on a monthly basis. I give it as it's designed to be given, which is twice a week for four weeks. I do this at the initial uh, diagnosis of joint pathology. And then also I will do it at flare-ups because realistically there's no evidence that giving it monthly has any effect. We are going to promote daily activity, but we're going to have to minimize concussive forces and think about, you know, if if there's a lot of slippery floors, we, we put down rugs, we maybe put runners on the, on the stairs, we maybe minimize jumping off of objects, we make some lifestyle changes, uh, but then we also have to have our daily exercise. And daily exercise is not running around in the backyard. <clears throat> that's ultimately daily playtime, which we can do, but we probably need to minimize the uh, frequency and duration of that and move over to actually daily exercise, which is going for a walk. And I like to build up to 20 to 30 minutes twice daily. So I don't think I'm actually uh, asking a lot of owners to have to participate in taking their dogs for a walk. And then we also need to get weight off of them by reducing caloric intake and adding in that daily exercise plan. The problem is, is if you have the dog that's painful, so the dog's in a flare-up, you can't physically expect to be able to exercise the dog and take the dog for a walk for them to lose weight. So it doesn't make sense to try to get weight off of a dog in the middle of a flare-up. It makes sense to get the flare-up under control and then do something about getting weight off of them. The challenging ones are the ones that are now in a flare-up. How do we know they're in a flare-up? Well, sometimes it's very simple. 
the not limping, and then they're limping. Other times it's challenging because they're coming into a flare up. And so we need to give owner strategies to recognize that. Some of them are able to keep that in check in their brain. Some of them need to keep a written journal. And then some of them have very busy lives with small children. So I say go to the craft store, get green, yellow, red marbles or popsicle sticks and assign a day. Green is a good day. Yellow is you forgot or you don't know. And red is a bad day. And if yellow and red start to outnumber green, we probably need to be seen uh, to ensure we're not either coming into a flare up or we're in a flare up that needs to be taken care of. Because if we're in a flare up, we're going to have to back off that daily uh, exercise. And then we have to look at what can we give in terms of getting that under control. Well, we've got our NSAIDs, which I said flare ups with a question mark, because I'll introduce a concept in a moment that might uh, send your brain for a, a whirl. Um, we've got opioids, but I don't think those are very good for chronic pain management. Sub-Q ketamines being thrown around uh, to use in some patients, perhaps when they're topped out of um, our oral pain medications. I've done 0.5 mg per kg. Um, some will do it to effect. Some will repeat it every two weeks. Some will repeat it every four weeks. Um, amantadine is another drug at three to five mg per kg. Um, once a day can be given twice a day, but it really needs to be given with an inset. It's not very effective as a solo pain management. Um, we've got gabapentin. Um, the thing with gabapentin is I think we probably need to get the dosage appropriate. So it means it probably needs to be greater than 10 mg per Kig, which can create sedation or wobbliness in some of our patients. It really needs to be given three times a day to be effective, which creates compliance issues. And so what I would tell you is stop giving it as needed for pain management and stop giving it once a day for pain management because it's likely not effective doing that. If we did want to use a drug in a similar class and only wanted to use it twice a day, that's where I would encourage you to maybe investigate pregabalin. That can be given at two to four mix per kig twice a day. Now that it's generic, the cost has come down a little bit. But I would uh, make you realize that, you know, we have to understand there's there's zero clinical evidence that gabapentin is effective in controlling joint pain. Um, there is evidence that amantadine is effective in controlling joint pain. But what I find is more people use gabapentin over amantadine, which is absolutely, in my mind, a bit bonkers. And so, you know, what I would leave you with is don't let gabapentin become the new tramadol. And if you're smiling, it's because, you know, you know, if you don't, then perhaps contact me later and I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, but ultimately, when it comes to NSAIDs, I think there's a couple of viewpoints. One is, should we use them as infrequently as possible? Or should we use them every day once we diagnose a patient with OA to maybe help manage the maladaptive process? And the maladaptive process basically just says that as uh, things linger, the brain is going to perceive the same stimulus as more painful over time. Or perhaps we do something in between. And, and what I do is ultimately base a uh, decision on clinical signs, response, uh, to previous uh, attempts at medications. What's their coast grade? What's the age? But then if we're going to think about using something maybe more frequently or for longer, we then have to ask ourselves, would daily or more frequent NSAID usage be both effective and safe? And interestingly enough, back in 2010, there was a review paper that came out that looked at both of these things. It looked at the papers evaluating short-term use, which was 14 days, and long-term use, which is greater than 28 days. And what they found is that the patients that were uh, ultimately on an NSAID longer did better than patients that were on NSAID shorter. But then they also looked at the adverse event reporting and found that it was very low and thought that, well, the adverse events are probably more to an individual animal rather than the drug class. And so with that being said, the studies do support efficacy of longer term NSAID use, and they do not support that doing that would be associated with a reduction in safety. So what I do is if I have a patient a flare up, I prescribe NSAIDs for one to four months. Typically, I'm going three to four months. You know, I think in the world of orthopedics, we have to understand nothing heals in two weeks except for the skin incision that I make. So a flare-up is not going to go away in two weeks. A tendinopathy is not going to go away in two weeks. An OA flare-up is not going to go away in two weeks. A fractured bone is not going to heal in two weeks. So this aspect of just prescribing incest for two weeks doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so what I'm going to do at 30-day mark is determine if I need to keep continuing it on 
or if I need to slowly taper it down or move to a less frequent administration, understanding that when they get later in the course of disease, such as a coast grade three or four, they're likely going to need daily usage. And I have no problem doing that. And then we can also consider adding in other analgesics or therapeutics. Because I think our current thought is this tar graph where a patient comes in painful, we put them on an NSAID, the pain goes away, we take away the NSAID, and then that process starts right back up. They hit another peak, we put them on an NSAID, then they drop to a trough again. But I think the reality is that they come in at a peak, we get that under control, we stop the NSAID, they hit a new peak, but that new peak is actually higher. And then we put them on an NSAID and ultimately we go to a new trough, but that trough isn't as low. So over time, they start to become less responsive with this sort of give for two weeks, take away, give for two weeks, take away kind of thing. And so I think if we're able to get an NSAID on board for a long enough duration, we can start to try to interrupt the cycle because if we can improve the inflammatory response and thus improve pain, we can see a decrease in exercise become an increase in exercise, which means we see more mobility in the joint, which we see improvement in range of motion and therefore limb function. Then we start to see muscle gain, weight loss, and then less stress onto the structures in and around the joint. And so, you know, one question then would be, is it a possible reality to get them on an NSAID either long-term or daily and then keep them below that sort of intensity level uh, to ultimately keep quality of life and pain under control? Um, and I've shown a couple of graphs with a lot of more just sort of linear ups and downs, which I think really simplifies osteoarthritis because why it's challenging is that the reality is this is osteoarthritis in terms of severity and pain and progression. It's all over the place, which is why it becomes challenging to manage in a lot of these patients. And so for me, um, what, uh, let's see, next slide, please. Oh, perfect. So as far as management goes, you know, I think if we're going to talk about using something for a longer period or even starting it earlier uh, or using it daily, that's where Galaprant may come into play and have the advantage because it's a specific anti-inflammatory that targets only the EP4. So we get blockage of inflammation within the joint, but we don't see blockage of the other prostaglandins affecting things like renal or gastric blood flow. But then also too, if you pull out the little white sheet in the box that comes with the font that you can't really see, and you look at the safety aspect of Galaprint, the margin of safety is very, very wide. And then if we look at the studies, what we see is that dogs actually get better the longer they're on it, whereas we start to see that delta or that change between Galaprant and placebo starting to increase as it gets out longer. So for me, it makes sense for ideal long-term usage if I'm going to have patients on an NSAID for three to four months. And so if we look at sort of defining what we should do, um, I think you know, what veterinarians have been asking for sort of roadmaps or algorithms as to what they need to do when, and that's where the canine osteoarthritis staging tool comes into play because we now have consensus statements on what we should be recommending based on the stage. So for example, a preclinical stage one is where I would focus on weight control, daily exercise with the owners, start an omega-3 fatty acid of 150 to 175 mg per kg of DHA or EPA. I would also start my joint supplement with particular ingredients geared towards modulating inflammation. I would also do Adequin twice a week for four weeks. Versus a stage two, this is where I'm going to come in with something like Galaprant for three to four months. We're going to back off the daily exercise, and then if we can get them off of the insect fantastic if we're not or they start to move into grade three then I'm going to start thinking about my NSAID more on a daily basis and then start asking myself if I should add in things like amantadine or pregabalin. Maybe I should inject the joint with something. Maybe we didn't try formalized rehabilitation therapy. Maybe we should try that. And then as we hit stage four, if they are on a daily anti-inflammatory as well as something like amantadine, other things are not becoming as effective, then ultimately I would start thinking 
thinking to myself, uh, maybe we need to try like some sub Q ketamine. Maybe we need to try hospitalization of lidocaine ketamine for 24, 48 hours, or maybe even bring in our monoclonal um, nerve growth uh, blockade uh, with something like Labrella, where I would give it, I would stop my NSAID at day 14, I would give one to two more injections of Labrella, I would stop the Labrella and then get them back on their uh, anti-inflammatory uh, medication from, from there. And so, you know, I think uh, this is the quick and dirty on, on some aspects of osteoarthritis. Obviously, many of those slides in and of themselves uh, would be um, ultimately seen, uh, you know, an entire lecture on, on their own. Um, and so, you know, I think we've got a few minutes for a few questions. Uh, you know, if, if you have a question, we don't get to it. Here's my email address. And if you're a social media fan, here's both Instagram and Facebook. Awesome. Dr. Dyke is truly awesome information. And I'm glad you put up that last slide because as a, uh, as a criticalist over here, um, one of our, and I'll get to the question brought up coast. And I was like, I'm going to sound so silly. I have no idea what that means. And so I'm frantically Googling behind the scenes. I found a handout. I was all excited that I knew what it meant and you brought it back up. So thank you for doing that. But truly awesome, very clinical information, which is what we love here on the Vet Girl platform. Obviously osteoarthritis is a huge, huge problem for our patients and one that can be frustrating clearly for pet owners and sometimes clearly for professionals as well. And some of these new medications, you know, Galaprant, for example, um, have really helped our ability to provide better quality of life. And that's ultimately what we're here for, right? To make our pets and our patients better and provide that great quality of life. Um, couple of housekeeping things very quick. I put it in the chat. I'm going to bring up the slide here one more time. And I promise once Dr. Dykus answers a question, I'm going to go ahead and put it back in there again. But remember, by 1 p.m. Eastern, which is about a half an hour from now, please make sure to fill out this form. Whether you type in the browser, I'll put the link in in a second, or use the QR code, please make sure to use your vet girl email address in doing so, so we can match your CE certificate to your account. And then again, as I said before, a huge shout out and thank you to Elenco. They're one of our amazing educational partners and they were able to help us provide this completely free race approved event worldwide. So with that, I'd love to get to a few questions. And again, I'll, I'll put that link in in a second. Remembering that we have a very, very international crowd. There was a question here, and we are talking about canine, because as the ERICU criticalist guy here, I'm not talking about felines when I talk about this drug, but acetaminophen. So Dr. Dykus, do you have any experience or thoughts on the use of acetaminophen? Remember, this is a very international crowd, and we have many countries that, that use this all over the world. And so uh, thoughts on acetaminophen as a profile for pain and or osteoarthritis in our canine patients? Yeah, that, that's actually a, a great question. I think, at least in the U.S., it's something that we probably don't think about using maybe as much as we should. Um, I don't tend to use acetaminophen chronically, not because I don't think it's effective, but mainly because I just it doesn't pop into my head uh, to think about. Um, but there are some that have looked at using acetaminophen and found that it can be helpful. Um, interestingly enough, usually we give um, codeine for our post-op patients, and sometimes we can't prescribe just codeine, so we'll do what's called Tylenol-3 or Tylenol-4, which is a human uh, component that has both acetaminophen and codeine in it. Um, and I sometimes wonder like, if maybe that has a better effect than, combined, than giving just codeine, for example, because the bioavailability in the dog is not that great. So while I can't personally talk about the effects of it, I do think it's worth keeping in the conversation as far as one of our chronic um, pain uh, management aspects. And, and I do believe, um, I don't know about long term, but you could co-combine acetaminophen with some of our other um, NSAIDs. Um, so I wouldn't have a problem with concurrent use of acetaminophen and galaprant, for example. I just don't know that I would promote doing it for like, you know, long term daily for, for many months at a time. Excellent. Yeah. I, for me as well, when I saw that, I was like, what a great question. And, and like you, 
in the US, we don't think about it first because of a lot of other availability or options that we have, but certainly internationally, I know it's uh, used a lot more than here in the US. And I thought, what a wonderful question to bring up of a drug that we may not think about all the time. And going back to our coast comment, let me just find that real fast here. This is where I sort of quickly Googling. So someone asked, um, in your coast one dogs, which uh, refresh and remind me, those are our preclinical early on dogs, right? Um, do you use, do you think of or use Adequan in those Coast One dogs? Yeah, so the Coast One is, is considered the preclinical. So these are dogs that would have underlying um, risk factors for OA, but they don't, they don't have clinical signs. They don't have radiographic signs yet. So this would be like the younger dogs with hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia that you might not um, be presenting to you for a lameness. Those are the ones that I think where Adequan is absolutely designed to be used. So I would absolutely recommend doing it twice a week for four weeks because where the disease modifying OA aspect came from was in puppies at, at a very young age with hip laxity. So I think that would be the ideal candidate to start Adequan at. Excellent. Thank you. And going back to some of your management, um, you were talking about amantadine as your preference over gabapentin and where you start with some of these dogs. Are you using gabapentin post-op on, on some of these patients? Uh, for some of my post-op surgical patients, yeah, we'll, we'll use gabapentin. I find the majority of them are already on gabapentin. Um, now, whether that's effective in controlling pain post-operatively, I think could still be open for discussion. We just don't have evidence that gabapentin is effective in controlling joint pain associated with osteoarthritis. Excellent. Thank you. And you commented on labrella. Is that for you something that you use short term or can that be considered something for long term therapy in your mind as well? Yeah, for me, currently, it's short term. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we need to see it being out for longer and used in different ways before we can really thumbprint and say, yes, it should absolutely be used long term. I think it's great at relieving pain. It's just not doing anything for inflammation. So I think it where it comes into play or more at the end stage where we need something to get pain under control. And then once we can get that pain under control, get back to uh, what we were on. And many of those dogs are already on uh, an inset. I wouldn't use Labrella long-term in place of, of the inset. Excellent. And you commented, and I love uh, this comment about uh, sub-Q ketamine. Um, um, now, if they're already on amantadine, is ketamine sub-Q helpful or is that just kind of like more of the same type of, of, of um, effect? And you don't yeah. use it together. I, I think the amantadine, we're not entirely sure on the mechanism of action, but it has NMDA-like inhibitors, whereas ketamine is probably going to do a much better job of, of hitting those receptors. And so if they're already on amantadine, I would have no problem giving them sub-Q ketamine and then continuing the amantadine. Usually with amantadine, I'm trying to go like 14 to 30 days. Um, I have a few patients that are on amantadine long-term and we haven't seen any adverse events. Um, in patients that I've given sub-Q ketamine to that were not on amantadine, I do send them home with amantadine afterwards. Um, and the hope, and I have no other than opinion, the hope that is if we can hit up those receptors with the ketamine, we can also keep pain um, somewhat at bay by continuing the amantadine for you know, 14 to 30 days after. And we'll finish off with one more question, which typically is, is always found in these pain arthritis type lectures. You commented on your dose of your omegas. Is there a brand or brands that you find to be more reputable, more helpful? We certainly know, you know, I go to the, the local supermarket and it's just tons of options out there. Not all are regulated or found to be the same. So sorry to put you on the spot, but are there any that you find you, you've looked into that they're at least for you more reputable, more trustworthy? Mm -hmm. more studied? Yeah, for, for me, my, my number one choice is going to be the Wellactin 3TA um, because number one, the dosage on the bottle is going to get you to that 150 to 175 mix per kg of DHA and EPA. Plus you also get the benefit of ETA, which is pernia or green lip muscle. Um, and you're going to be getting an appropriate dosage there as well. Um, and the reasoning for that is we know, at least within that line from, from Nutramax, that if any third party tested, it's going to meet label claim. They do have financial investment in um, quality control. So we know that, that 
purity of ingredients and there's not going to be impurities in it and put into it, especially things like heavy metals when it comes to omega threes, because if they find impurities, when they test lots, they're going to pull it, but they also have in-house research and, and development. So they've got the data to say, if you take this and put it to the cell, it's going to have this effect. So, you know, ultimately I think for something that we can get concentrated, that's going to be my, my number one recommendation for the omega threes. Awesome. Well, Dr. Dykus, uh, thank you. Thank you to Alenko. This was an amazing session. Um, it's so clinically relevant as we talked about, you know, uh, obesity, osteoarthritis. It, it's it's not going away. It is something that affects most of our, our pets at some point during their age and is something that can be truly, truly debilitating. I, I, I know that I've had cases in the ER that unfortunately, um, you know, euthanasia has been the outcome because the, the pet, while they are mentally there, while they have no metabolic disease, they, they are just in such such bad pain that the outcome is, is, you know, quality of life. And if we can have them have a better quality of life, if, if we can uh, uh, lengthen their life, if we can make their pet parents happier, I mean, that's what we're here for, right? So all of these amazing drugs that, that we now have the ability to think of, to prescribe, to use, and giving our pets and our patients just that better quality of life, better comfort, longevity, et cetera. It's, it's truly amazing. So thank you for sharing your knowledge, your your, your educational wealth, and and uh, we uh, we hope to see on some more Vecral webinars soon. Again, everybody, please make sure if you have not before, check out our full library. Dr. Dykus has other stuff on our platform. Make sure you sign up for Vecral U in New Orleans. I mean, come on, beignets, chicory coffee, a lot of fun. <laughs> we'll all be there. Um, and we hope to see you online at another Vecral event. So we hope you have a great rest of your day week and we'll see you at the next event. Have a great one, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.